This is Home Tech, show number 105, recorded on January 31st, 2013. Here on Home Tech, we cover all your favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studios here in a snowy and super cold Bellevue, Nebraska. And we post the show with world-class show notes each week out at TheAverageGuy.tv. If you have questions, concerns, or comments, even some contributions, you can contact the show. Just send me an email, podcast at TheAverageGuy.tv. Find me on Twitter. I am just Jay Collison, or you can follow the show schedule each week at the Average Guy TV. If you're listening, if you're new to listening to podcasts and you're looking for a way to listen each week, you uh, you might want to try consider using Stitcher. We've been talking about it for the last uh, month or so. It's available for both Android and iPhone platforms. A great way to listen to your podcast, both at home and on the road. It is audio only, uh, but of course, the show and all the past shows are on Stitcher. Stitcher.com. Search Home Tech. It's education for your ears. We also have a link to it out on TheAverageGuy.tv. Just look for the Stitcher icon. And now Home Tech, uh, Financial Tech, and Rich's Random Podcast, which are all back in production at this point. If you've walked away from any of those podcasts, we are producing those. In fact, we're going to record a Financial Tech right after the show tonight. I've got Andrew Hunt all lined up to do that. If you want to stay around and uh, and watch that, you might just want to do that. Andrew and I will do a quick 15-minute Financial Tech right after this show is over. You can also view and subscribe to this show on YouTube. Um, I've been getting some comments, some folks wanting the video feed, and I'm, I'm still going to f- maybe do that, so we'll see. For right now, head out to youtube.com slash the average guy, or catch this show each week, and most of you that are listening right now, in fact, all of you who are listening right now, have caught it live, 8 p.m. Central, over at theaverageguy.tv live. And don't forget, we have both groups on Facebook, that's just facebook.com slash groups slash the average guy. And a new one on Google Plus, search for The Average Guy Podcast. And don't forget to visit TheAverageGuy.tv slash Amazon. When purchasing from Amazon, we roll all that back into giveaways. In fact, thank you if you bought from Amazon in December. We had a big month in December, and those will pay out 1st of March. And we got a give, we've got we got some giveaway stuff coming up. You can also join us for a live chat during the show. If you've came come in from YouTube, Come over to TheAverageGuy.tv, look right below you on this window, and there's chat. You don't need an account. Just sign in, and you can get started. A bunch of you guys out there in chat tonight. Guys, welcome. We got a great show ahead for you. All right, I got a bunch of announcements. I'm just going to plow through these real quick because I want to get them out to you. I know if I put them in the end, you won't listen to them. I mentioned earlier we've got a big giveaway coming up on December 15th. It'll be through from December 15th to the end of the month, about $500 worth of giveaways. So stay tuned for those. We're going to actually do that in conjunction with JPEG to Raw, Mike Howard's podcast. And uh, we're going to do a special giveaway. So watch the site. We've got about 15 days or about two weeks. Uh, and that's coming up. Stay tuned. You'll want to be a part of that. Um, I just kicked off a new series called Home Tech Interview. And uh, if you haven't caught it yet, I actually just put it in the feed. So it's going to be right behind this podcast. Uh, we did an interview with Ray Ortega. He is a podcast consultant. We talked about podcasting. So if you're thinking about starting a podcast, I don't know why anybody would want to, but if you were thinking about starting a podcast uh, or you just want to know how to do your podcast better, as Andrew gives me the cut it, um, uh, go back one episode, Ray Ortega. It was a great interview. He gave me a lot of time, about an hour's worth. You will want to listen to that as well. And then a quick shout-out to Greg Gerke. I think that's G-E-R-K-E. Uh, he actually tracked me down at the Drobo, the Omaha Drobo Average Guy Hangout that we did on Wednesday night. I guess it was just last night. Mario Blandini is here in town. And he and I and Greg and some staff from the Drobo headquarters showed up, and we got a chance to talk about Drobos and such, and uh, they actually Drobo has a new announcement of some things that are coming up, and they're not hardware related. Okay, so just it's a surprise. I can't really tell you. Speaking of surprises, there's one for Andrew, an early podcaster is is in the making right now. But uh, Greg, appreciate you coming out last night for the meetup here in Omaha. Uh, for the next two weeks, no home no, no home tech podcasts. You guys have the weeks off, so Christian and Andrew, you guys can enjoy. A little bit of break. The podcast won't stop. I've got an interview with Brian Burgess lined up uh, to fill in for next week. It'll just come in the uh, the feed 
uh, like this show normally would. So next weekend and the weekend after that, an interview with Mike Howard and Chris Barnes as we talk about kind of the future of podcasting and there was some CES talk in there and we talk a little bit about TVs. It was such a good interview and many of you didn't get a chance to hear it. I'm going to replay it again. Um, the show, it won't be live. It's just going to show up in the feed. So take two weeks off, guys. Don't come out here. Do something different. Get some sunlight. All those things. Uh, we'll be off for the next two weeks, but the feed will continue. Uh, and I'll be actually in Southern California next week, so Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday if you're in the Southern Cal California area. Primarily around downtown L.A., I'll be at USC and UCLA on Wednesday and Thursday and uh, might have a few minutes in the evening if you're around those areas. So if you are and you want to join me in a quick meetup, I mean, we can, um, we can find some place to grab a bite to eat or a drink. Send me a, an email podcast at theaverageguy.tv. That's next Wednesday. Let's see, what are those dates? Those are February 6th and 7th. So if you're listening to this in 2014, it's long gone. But uh, February 6th and 7th, I'll be in the LA area, USC, UCLA on those campuses. Let me know, and maybe we can get together. And then uh, one more shout out to at the Jason on Twitter. He tweeted me from the Netherlands. I mentioned I'm going to be in Germany March 19th, actually March 20th through the 28th. And he said, hey, let's get together for a meetup. Well, where he's at and where I'm at, about 500 kilometers. So I'm not expecting him to make it. But if you are in the Frankfurt, Germany area and you're listening to this podcast, I'm sure that we have tons of people in Frankfurt, Germany listening to the podcast. But if you are, uh, let me know, podcast at theaverageguy.tv. Maybe we can get together for a beer. That would be great, and I, I would love doing it. All right, let's quick get the guys introduced, and then uh, we will dig into some tech. I'm excited. we got some good stuff tonight. Of course, all the way over to my left, and uh, he has one of the newest members of his household with him. And uh, how's that going so far, Andrew Morris? How are you doing? Yeah, it's going pretty well. I'm going to have to use uh, the mute button very judiciously during the show today because he's... Uh, bit ratty at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, it's good to see them. They're, they're doing well, I assume, uh, and uh, and growing quickly. <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, Andrew, welcome to the show. And then, of course, back uh, and looking actually um, awake this week. <laughs> the, the homework must not be too bad. Christian Johnson. Christian, how are you? Hey, I'm doing. Uh, the homework is still sort of weird and strange, but um, I'm doing good. Uh, life is, is life, and uh, work is work, and play is play, so that's about it. <laughs> well, good. Well, welcome back, and uh, we got some good stuff for you tonight, so uh, thanks for coming out. And, of course, in his rotation as a guest host and back on the show for some more punishment, Kevin Schoonover. <laughs> Kevin, you're like this, you were the CES guru, man. You knew more about what was going on with those laptops <laughs> than those guys who are supposed to know. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. We had a good time down there. Yeah, thanks for doing that. That was fabulous. You you uh, you did a great job on the floor with Dave. And if folks wonder what I'm talking about, go out to uh, uh, youtube.com slash home server show and uh, go down through the CES coverage. And I think we were in the Samsung booth or the Intel booth. I, I, was that was the Intel? Intel booth. Yeah, it was the Intel booth. We were wandering around there. So Kevin got a chance to join us in, in there and uh, walked through some of the the, uh, the the mod the laptops that were there and and uh, he was schooling the he was schooling the reps so some good coverage uh, from CES as well Kevin welcome to the show okay well a couple things usually I take all my items and I go last but I want to dig right in because that's a, for a change I got some really good stuff so uh, many of you know on the show I've been having trouble with the with my internet connection dropping. Hasn't done it a lot during this show, but during home server show, just for whatever reason, kids would be surfing, I would be surfing, we'd be doing the show, plop, down the internet would go, and of course that would cause havoc and uh, major edits for the show and such like that. And So I began replacing everything from the switches up. So a couple months ago, I replaced all my switches and went gigabit on everything. Um, a couple months or a month right after that, I replaced my wireless router with a D-Link DIR655, which I got. I think, Kevin, that may have been a refurb uh, link that you put in the Average Guy group. That was a refurb deal over at Newegg, and it was a great yep. deal. It's a great deal. So I replaced that. Things still dropping off. And so finally last weekend, I went out to Best Buy and picked up a new Motorola uh, let's see, it's a Motorola SB6141 
um, DOSIS 3.0 cable modem. And uh, it's just, you know, you're run of the mill, 100 bucks kind of deal. Had a $25 gift card, so I threw that in there. And I picked up the cable modem and I put that in and had uh, called Cox and had them install it. You know, they got to do some wizardry on their end and make it work. And then um, started doing some download speeds, uh, you know, some speed checks. And oh my God, I could not believe the difference. And I had an old Cisco, no, an old, what's the blue ones? Um, the blue with the black front. Is that Link, a Cisco? Linksys. Linksys. Yeah. yeah, I had an old Linksys, Doxys 2 that I've had for about five or six years. And um, it, it was, it did great. A little workhorse. It was fine. And I was getting about, let's say 15 or 20 down and just maybe five up in that. And uh, when I replaced this out, and I, I was a little skeptical because I thought, you know what, I only pay for, right now, I only pay for 20 and three. That's all I pay for. And so I thought certainly a new modem would not make a difference. And guys, I, uh, Mike Howard will attest, we were rocking almost 30 down and a solid 15 to 20 up on this modem. And I don't know if that's trickery or if I'm actually getting that, but consistent speed tests have shown just way faster speeds than I would expect. Is that is that real? Am I really getting that up and down throughput, or is there some trickery going on? You guys know? I, I think you're getting that that throughput. That that seems reasonable. Um, I'm on Comcast here, and I get uh, 25 down and about three up. Um, the interesting thing there was, uh, you know, Comcast keeps advertising higher and higher speeds, and uh, out of the blue, they offered to come out and, and uh, at that time I was renting, and they offered to come out and give me a new Doxus 3 modem. And the guy who installed it, uh, I, I said, you know, it's kind of out of the blue. I usually have to complain to get you guys to do something. And he goes, well, it would kind of be false advertising if we told you you could get 25 down and told you you were paying for 25, and then we didn't give you a modem that was capable of doing that. So after they installed the rental modem, I, like you, had had some Best Buy gift cards, went out and uh, picked up a, uh, I happened to get a Cisco to replace and got rid of the rental fee, and, and like I said, I'm pulling 25 down and three up, so it's, it's, a, it's a good deal. Well, I was a little stunned by the 15 or 20 up that I was getting consistently. I, 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 you know, I was like, holy moly, this is incredible. So I was real happy, called Mike Howard. We were woohoo, woohoo, and then all of a sudden, so I started, I thought, well, let me test this out. I'm going to upload some of the podcast files uh, to, to the web server, which Christian helps me out with. And uh, let's just see if I'm really getting those kinds of speeds. So I set about three of them to upload, and sure enough, right in the middle of the upload, everything went down. And I was like, oh, are you kidding me? So I didn't have the problem solved at that point. I thought, oh, so I called. As soon as it was down, I called Cox. Um, the lady, the first lady that helped me out was fantastic. Her name was Joanne. So Joanne, if you work for Cox Cable, you do tech support, you hear this podcast, you were fantastic. She called me by my name. She was really nice. She was helpful. Then she sends me, and Christian, you would have loved this guy. Okay, so she's like, okay, we're going to send you to second level support. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, great, second level, a guy who, who probably will know something, right, So or gal. So there's music, and she says, okay, Mr. Collison, we're going to transfer you, and there's some music. And then I, the, the, I hear the other end pick up, and I hear, hello? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, uh, yeah, I was waiting for somebody to help me with, and he goes, yeah. Um, I'm, so I'm having some trouble with my, yeah, she told me. Okay, so what do you need from me, <laughs> right? And this guy was just a zero. Uh, his name was Alan, and he would not, he goes, so I said, uh, and I'm sure all you guys in chat have had this experience <laughs> with the tech guy. So he's, I said, the internet is, just keeps dropping on me. He goes, well, do you have any bit torrents? It's probably the bit torrents. <laughs> and I'm like, well, no, don't, no torrents that I know of. And, well, then he goes, well, then it's Dropbox. You probably have Dropbox syncing. And I'm like, okay, so what you're telling me is that I can't use Dropbox because it brings your internet, connect it brings my internet connection down, right? Is that, is that what you're saying? I can't use Dropbox? Well, no, but sometimes that causes, I said, look, I should be able to use all my services 
and even if I, you know, well, those things flood the network sometimes, and uh, that can cause your internet. Okay, so what you're telling me is if I flood the network, the expected behavior is that the internet goes down. Is that what you're telling me, Alan? Well, no, no, it, it should stay up. Well, okay, so why isn't it, <laughs> you know? So we go through all the shut this down, shut it down, turn it up, bring it up. You know, all the things you guys have walked through. You know that nightmare experience of trying to get your 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 internet provider. So he uh, he can see the router through the you know through the connection, and he goes, "Are you sure that that router can handle the traffic that you're sending through it?" And I said, "What's well, a brand new? You know, it's a 655." And then I start looking at it, and I've got all four ports full. You know, there's four network gigabit and Ethernet ports on the back. Those are all full. Uh, two are routing out to the HD home runs that I have. The other two go, are going to two switches that each have eight ports on them, and <laughs> they're all full. And uh, I was like, well, maybe I am sending a little too much traffic. It's quite possible I'm sending it. Maybe, maybe that, that D-Link... Uh, wireless router cannot handle all the traffic I'm sending. Maybe that little tiny processor that was super cheap. I mean, there's a reason these things are cheap, right? Um, can't handle it. So I um, I had remembered a little box that I had been trying to set up for a while called a super router or a PF Sense. We call it a super router. Everybody else calls it a PF Sense router. Mike Howard's been trying to talk me into one of these for a long time, and. I had all the equipment set up. I just had not gotten it all complete. So in about an hour, I set up a PFSense router. It's a it's an Atom 525, D525, with about 4 gig of RAM on it. Never use any of that to its full capacity. Um, and I put a 60 gig SSD drive on it just because I had one, and it was laying around. And um, and I got that up and running in about an hour, and it the, the connection speeds have been rocking. And ever since I did that, I, and, I, and I turned the, the D-Link... In, did you hear Sarah back there? See, I told her <laughs> I'm podcasting. I told her I'm podcasting. It doesn't really matter, does it? So um, the they turned the, the D-Link into just an access point. So that's only doing wireless now at this point. And the the, uh, the super router is, is the PFSense router is handling all the traffic. Guys, I love it. I don't know. Uh, Christian, have you ever used PFSense at all? Have you set that up? Um, no, I've had a friend look at it. I've looked at it with a friend before, and it does look really cool, uh, the interface and everything. I know Mike Howard is a big fan of it, um, so it might be something worth looking into when we redo our network next month. Yeah, let me bring up some of the reports. Kevin, have you used it all? Um, I started playing with it a little bit, and then I um, started uh, experimenting with a competitive product uh, from Astero, uh, their version of it, and then I just—I uh, should have did the unboxing, but I. Uh, this is this is what I'll be deploying this weekend. It's the. Uh, should pull that back up again. I it's missed the, you. There we it's go. the Zixel, uh, their firewall uh, model okay. twenty. Okay. So I'm I'm overhauling my network a little bit at a time, much like uh, yep. you said I. Uh, Got a gigabit backbone, but my routing and uh, other security functions were lacking. So I'm going with this for now. I'm going to keep playing around. Uh, the Astero solution, which is now called Sophos. Uh, Astero was bought by Sophos. A um, little more complex than the PFSense, but um, I'll, I'll give you an update when I uh, get a little farther downstream with that one. Now, how do you pronounce that? Uh, Sophos. So, no, the the name on the brand of the the... The one I bought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold I'm not that sure. back up again. I'm not. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. It's uh, Z Y X E L. Yeah. Zycel. Zycel. Yeah. I have two of their switches, and I've just loved them. They were like thirty-five bucks. They're eight-port mm -hmm. gigabit, and they've just been rock solid. Yeah, they um, they tend to do a good job. Um, some of the guys out in chat, uh, Race Car Mike is a big fan of the 50 version of this, which uh, includes a little more UTM functions. You can uh, contract for um, uh, antivirus scanning and some other features behind the scenes with it. But uh, I'm going to give the 20 a shot here and see how it goes. Cool. Yeah, you'll have to keep us posted on that. Um, I, I brought up the the dashboard for, and I was resizing the screen. You guys may not be able to read everything, but uh, this is the dashboard for PFSense, and uh, you got to kind of get some idea. These are some real-time stats of 
kind of what's going through the router right now. The red is what I am pulling down, and the black is what is going back. And, uh, you know, so this Hangout doesn't look like I got much going on. This Hangout, whatever else is going on on the network, is around 500 kilobits at this point, and I'm pulling about one point. Oh, 1.5 on average right now. We see it spike from time to time. But it's really nice. You can kind of see, you know, about 2% of the CPU and about 4% of the memory are in use. And um, it's got some it's got some good little reports in here uh, that allow me. One of the things that Mike was, you know, we were, I was having so many problems with, uh, with the Internet connection. One of the reports that we looked at on this, this RRD graph was this quality tab. And the red down here are drop packets. Uh, right below, you can kind of see right below the gray. And so um, when we first turned this thing on, there was a bunch of red on the bottom. I was dropping a bunch of packets, and we had a setting um, set incorrectly. And so we were, on the, you could hear it in the audio, that the, we kept dropping packets all the time. And so the audio was poor. We got the setting turned around and put back on, and, uh, and it's been working flawless. So I'm, uh, I'm a PFSense convert. I think mm -hmm. um, it's this is one of these things. It gives you some great reports. There's tons of things you can do with it. Um, we spent a little time. There are some plugins that you can add to it. Um, and uh, one of the things I immediately did was I, um, of course, I pointed the DNS over to OpenDNS. Haven't talked about that in a while. And and you know, of course, OpenDNS is a service you can use. For me, it's supposed to speed up your internet connection by using faster DNS servers, but. I like it because they have some content filtering, spam monitoring, uh, phishing, anti-phishing capabilities through their service. Um, and, and so I, um, I pointed it to OpenDNS and have just had a really good, have been having a really good experience since I did that. So the router's been up now oh, almost four days without a drop. Mm -hmm. And so I'm pretty convinced at this point that we have the problem we have the internet speed connection dropping problem solved, and I'm pretty sure I was overwhelming my wireless router at this point. So it's um, I don't know. I've never seen that before, where you know you just the router just kind of gives up the ghost and it reboots and uh, and starts again. But um, Christian, have you seen that in any of the work that you've done with with anybody in the networks? What in particular, the PF sense? No, no, where the where, the, where maybe a router is overwhelmed by the network traffic that's that's oh. going through it. Mm. Gosh, I mean, we have routers that just die after like three or four years, and that's when you can tell either they were overheated, overloaded, or just not really a great design. Um, we've normally had to replace our wireless router every two to three years, and we don't run you know, like load, fully load. I can tell you, though, that the switch... See, what makes more sense to do, rather than having those four ports active on the router, just throw everything into a switch and only make one line up to the router because, like I said, the switches... We've had the same gigabit switches for eons, and they just work fine. So, and we just bought a, uh, uh, a new 24-port uh, gigabit switch for the uh, dual gigabit... Uh, cards to have the dual bandwidth over each uh, port, so that'll be cool. No, I, I agree. I, I tend to break things up into components. I have separate wireless access points, um, router set separately, switching is separate. Um, but that that's a great point, Jim, is when I started researching, you know, kind of the direction I wanted to go in, I noticed that a lot of the routers are measuring bandwidth through, and it's one of those technology shifts is we never used to worry about it because your router was always faster than the internet you had coming in the house. And, you know, part of this upgrading is is you know I, I'm up, upgrading all this computer equipment and what kind of got me going is the you know the the thing that was posted on uh, the Facebook page about Microsoft's antivirus coming in you know last and I started realizing that you know I've upgraded all this technology and I'm looking at you know probably a 10 year old 3com router and you know how well is that protecting my network and how good is the bandwidth on it. So um, upgrading these different components. The other thing I'm thinking, and I think you'll see with PFSense, um, just in my own circle of you know people I know, people who've gone from a traditional uh, NAT router type of technology to some type of firewall, like a PFSense or something like I've got here, um, they tend to see um, malware and other issues kind of drop off. Um, and I just think these things do a better job of protecting you or identifying that you have something going on. 
Yeah, and, and with PFSense, we were able to block you know incoming requests. They have they have I think eight countries that produce like ninety percent of the world spam <laughs> stuff, right, or malware. So Russia, Thailand, uh, you know, um, uh, Afghanistan, you know, just a bunch of countries. And so there's a setting in there. It's kind of a one click. You can just block everything from those countries. So we went out to a Russian uh, language site, and it sure it just blocked it. I figure if my kids come to me and they need access to a Russian site, I I'll probably open it up for them. But for now, <laughs> we're just gonna lock. So I'm gonna lock some of that down and see how it goes. No complaints yet with both OpenDNS or PFSense from the kids saying they can't get to a site. That was real common. A couple of years ago when I first, sti- first started, it seems like those routers and stuff would block whatever they were trying to get to. In those days, it was Club Penguin and MySpace and some of those things. Mm-hmm. They would get blocked. None, not one complaint at this point from anybody that, uh, that anything's been stopped. And I, I do agree. I think I, I don't see many viruses on my system, but uh, and we haven't had one internally for a long time, but I think that does set up a nice system for you. So for the average guy, PFSense, I had it up and running in about an hour. Um, I have it running on some very, very inexpensive hardware. That gigabyte board that's got that Atom 525 on it was like $70. And I, I can you can throw it in a mini case and a couple NIC cards. And you do have to have two NIC cards, uh, and gigabit would be preferable. And you're kind of in a in a hard drive. You don't even need a really good hard drive. I mean, it, it anything pretty much as long as it spins or it's SSD would work just great. So, I um I've been pretty excited about it. And so I want to thank Mike Howard for the work that uh, that he did with me on that. We did a bunch of testing on it. And I would very much recommend to anybody at this point if you're at all in the in the in the space where you want to kind of monitor your traffic or you want to add some additional functionality to the, the data that's coming in and through. Um, uh, PFSense is a great way to do it and super easy. And then there's cert super there's tons of super geeky stuff that you can do with Untangled and some of those other packages that come with it. I'm not going to mess with it. I'm just going to leave it like it is, leave it up and running. It's sitting there humming along, uh, and it's been great. So, Mike, thanks for your help on that, and, and appreciate that doing that. And uh, Kevin, it sounds like you've got some equipment going in that we should mm-hmm. follow. Christian, any new gear in your place that, uh, from a network standpoint, have you guys enacted any upgrades yet? <laughs> you were talking about that a couple weeks back. Yeah, that, well, the 24-bit switch is one. Uh, we just put in, uh, we just bought three three terabyte drives that were on sale for like 129 I think. Um, so we put those in to give us some more recording space on our TV because we're at about six terabytes worth of recorded storage. So then we're going to offload that off of our network storage uh, to the local drives on that uh, HTPC. And then we're going to start... Um, rolling that server that used to do the media into a server 2012 essentials box and then start rebuilding the network from the ground up. Oh, cool. So you've got some, you got some work to do coming up here. Andrew, how are things on your end? Are kids doing okay there? Yeah, yeah, I was just, uh, just at the start of feed so that we'd get a bit of silence. <laughs> you, um, with, I assume with the kids, Andrew, you're not getting much time to do anything at this point, right? No, pretty much I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm keeping things running. Uh, Mich- Michelle's get go- going through uh, Grey's Anatomy and Spooks episodes at a rapid rate of knots, so <laughs> I'm uh, down- downloading more TV shows than I have in a long time. Just, um, just trying to keep the uh, entertainment wheels on the bus, right? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Um, but, yeah, I mean, with, with respect to um, the problems that you're having, we don't touch wood. I've, I've been fairly lucky. I've got a, um, a Linksys... 3925 that came from the ISP, which um, I don't get an option to change out. So um, on cable here, you get you get a choice of that or a Nikki. Um, both of them have small NAT tables, which typically tends to be the um, the biggest issue you have with them, especially if you're downloading on torrent or whatnot. Um, you know, as soon as you get multiple streams going through it, the NAT tables tend to to get rather upset, um, and you know. Torrent. I mean, on a on a good download for a torrent, and for example, I'll get up to upwards of probably 25 megabits a second. Um, so it, it'll it'll scream pretty hard, but then the router will last for about two or three minutes and reboot itself to clear yeah. its tables. Yeah. 
Well, I can't say that Tim's not out there. Tim's my 15 year old uh, yeah. using torrent. I know he does. He there's for software and stuff. He does do that. And I've told him I really don't want him doing that, but he <laughs> doesn't. And I'm sure there were times when I was. Get content. <laughs> well, yeah, that's it. Just is what it is. Um, I'm sure those times it was what was happening as he was firing some things up. I, of course, have got for the podcast, especially uh, when we do home server shows. Well, I got a bunch of stuff going on, and I'm I'm sure we were just overwhelming. And like I think Kevin, like you said, I'm or or maybe Christian, I may not have had my my kind of my topology the the way I have it set up right. I probably could have optimized it by keeping all the traffic with the switches, and then having one switch going to the to to the router to get out. You know, or one yeah. um, one line to go to the router to get out, and and that probably would have been more efficient and kept all that traffic on the switches instead of having it go through the router all the time. You know, I'm the average guy on this. I don't spend a lot of time studying my wireless router or even know what's in there in most cases. Um, but it does sound like we were overwhelming it. Now it only does wireless. I turned off DHCP. Yeah. It's just been fantastic. So it's been a good setup. Yeah, pretty pr- mm-hmm. pretty much all I've got attached to my router. I've got my voice over IP box, so I've got a um. Uh, Linksys 3102, which talks out to our, our VoIP provider. I've got that connected, and I've got um, I've got that connected, and I've got um, a couple of and I've got a network attached printer, and everything else then connects into a into a switch. Okay. So I've I've offloaded yeah. all the serious processing off the router. Well, I've learned a lot in this about these setups. And um, and so, do you need to go, Andrew, and take it? Okay. Um, I've learned a ton about about some network, you know, behind the scenes stuff. So it's been good to go through um, to go through that process. I think you muted yourself, Andrew. Were you trying to say something? Oh, is he talking on the phone? He must be talking on the phone. Okay. Um, one other thing, I wanted to say thanks to Jim Barton. On he is a member on our Facebook page, uh, Facebook.com/slash/group/slash. The average guy, um, he he put a post out there about using some cloud storage space to, and he called it hybrid cloud uh, storage. And um, in a link to a post that he he's kind of put together on Box, he's actually um, using 15 different cloud-based storages to get about 150 terabytes uh, total of space um, out there, which. It's a lot of maintenance to keep track of all those various cloud storage options. If you're interested in knowing what some of them are, some of them are. Most of those are listed in the cloud storage know it guide out on the average guide.tv. Just look for the blue box. I think it's blue. It says cloud storage on it. And we have a lot of those, although he mentioned a few that I don't have. So I'm going to have to go back through and add them into the cloud storage guide. Um, when he posted it, I was I was hoping what he had done is found some way to link those all together so that he had one volume and he was slicing that data up among, and I, I know that's too much probably to expect, but I was hoping he had one volume so to the user it would look as like one big volume and then it was saving that data out to these various free services, not necessarily the case on that. But it did highlight the fact that that you know, to get 15 services in 150 terabytes of space for most, mostly free, means the average provider there is at about 10 gig. And so I am seeing the average cloud offering start to creep up um, on those. And I just saw a new one come out. I think that that um, one we, we looked at last week is 10 gig worth of free space. So some cool stuff out there. Kevin, I know you interacted with that post. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I'm glad he wrote it up. But, you know, like, like you say, he's probably doing what we've talked about a lot of. It's just nice to see it all laid out in a process of here's where I store this, here's where I store that. Um, the, one of the intriguing things that jumped out to me is, um, and I had kind of lost sight that um, uh, Microsoft's Exchange Online is now available, you know, it was kind of a small business thing and now it's available to users. So we're, you know, you're looking at four bucks a month per person to have your own exchange service, and uh, that's something I'm going to start to look into a little bit for some folks that uh, I know who could take advantage of that. Yeah, and we've talked about this before, but one of the things I've been doing recently is installing that software on my Windows Home Server. So I run Windows Home Server 2011. I'm on a microserver N40L, like most of us are at this mm-hmm. point. 
And uh, and what I do, like with SkyDrive and with Dropbox and with Box and with all those other ones that have a client install, Pogo Plug is one of them, is I can actually install those on the server themselves and then use the home server to expose those. You know, so Dropbox creates a Dropbox folder on the Windows home server. I can put that Dropbox folder as part of all the rest of the shared file folders that are out there, and so I can access that folder, that Dropbox folder, from any PC in the house. And I don't have to have Dropbox running, contrary to what Alan thought. I don't, uh, from Cox Communications, thank you, Alan, for your helpfulness. <laughs> I don't have to have Dropbox running on every PC in the house to take advantage of it. it. runs on one PC, the Windows Home Server. I drop those files in Dropbox, and then they go up, then the Home Server takes care of moving them up to Dropbox and doing that. So I'm only syncing the file on my network in one place. That's actually a tip I got from Mike Fauché over at BYOB um, way back when he talked about that, I think, with SkyDrive, and I've just started applying it. So that's kind of a hybrid model that allows me to take advantage of Box and Dropbox and some of those other services. I still have individual folders, though, in on my Windows Home server that I, I access, and they're just called Dropbox and Box and, you know, whatever that are on there. Um, it would be great if I could somehow then put something virtual on top of that. That would, you know, that would just it would be. I'm, I know I'm asking for too much, but uh, it would take advantage of all those services. But that is one way, kind of, of getting. And then you can through Windows Home Server, you can then have a cloud. You know, you can have a sign in, a remote sign in to your Windows Home Server, and basically create your own private cloud at that point. That's one way to do it. We talked last week about Pogo Plug offering the twenty nine dollar. Unlimited. I think that ends today, so you'd have to be listening live to take advantage of that. But uh, I know Tim took advantage of that. Um, one of the hosts over at JPEG to Raw took advantage of it, and a couple guys had posted in the in the group. They did that. So all kinds of cheap ways. I mean, that's unlimited. So you know, as we talk about storage, both with Crash Plan and now Pogo Plug. Who else am I missing? Who is giving away unlimited storage for a reasonable price? Who am I missing? Shout them out there in chat. Mm, can't think of their name. Crash plan. Um, okay, we'll wait for those to come in. I'm sure there are others that are doing that as well. Christian, are you taking advantage? I mean, you use what do you use for cloud stuff, and how do you use it? Well, I'm really bad. Well, pretty badly right now using Dropbox. I was just thinking this week that I was <laughs> going right. to either either create a new account or get one of these. Uh, Oh, I just saw a new service that they launched that looked really, really tight. That's like Dropbox, and it's, I don't think it's BoxNet. It was something else, but um, essentially, you know, five gigs free off the bat, which is more than I had with the Dropbox referral system anyway. Um, I was also contemplating SkyDrive, but, you know, I don't really, if, if, I'm not putting, like, my own personal documents or something on a server for me to just grab, um, then chances are I'm uploading it to my own virtual servers anyway and just downloading it from my FTP, so. You're not the average high no. schooler. No. You are not. Yet. No, I'm not. But, but, um, but if I was, I would probably choose SkyDrive or Google or something. Yeah, you know, one of the cool things we did with SkyDrive during CES, you know, Dave took pictures on us, and you can do this with just about any phone where that SkyDrive app is available, and it automatically uploads those pictures into a uh, into a pictures camera roll, and then you can share that camera roll uh, in real time with anybody. So they can they can go out, you can embed that on a web page, and they can go out and look at those pictures as you're uploading it. So if you're going to go on vacation and you want to share pictures with friends, and you don't want to have to worry about all that crap out on Facebook. You can just create a page, uh, you know, somewhere, embed that code on the page, and then give your family and friends access mm -hmm. to the page, and then have access to the camera roll. I think that'd be a little better than spamming people on Facebook. Yeah. So, not a bad idea. That's kind of like uh, with being able to share all your, you know, if you're taking a bunch of photos on your Android phone and then just uploading them to Google Drive or not Drive, Google uh, Plus, and then just sending who you want to have updates for. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I like that, the fact that in the photography circles, that has become so easy now to share pictures from your phone. Really, it can be automatic to several services. I think Dropbox does it. I think Box does it. I think 
SkyDrive does it now. We know Google Plus does that for sure. Most of them, when you install them, I think SugarSync does, when you install it, it says, do you want, on your phone, it says, do you want to upload your pictures automatically? Well, you have to be careful because you could, I, I, I've installed, because of the Know It Guide, I have installed every cloud service that I know on my Android phone. And if all of them were uploading the pictures to all the service, my phone battery would go dead, you know, every time I took a picture. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you know, so you got to be careful of that too. Yeah. Okay, one, any, any other thoughts on that? One last thing, and then I'll, I'll let you guys have the show back. How does that sound? All right. So um, I just want to give you an update on the Yeti. So we talked a little bit about I had to send the, the, uh, the blue Yeti back to, um, back to blue for RMA. It, it did have some problems, and thank you, uh, Bailey, over at Blue for getting that fixed promptly, and I have a brand new one here, so thanks, guys, for doing that. They did forget to send the shock mat back, and in one email, and they said, oh, terribly sorry, and they shipped, uh, uh, Mike Howard actually watched me unbox that here this evening. They shipped the shock mount, so that's back as well. I am so liking this Audio Technica, uh, the 2100, that I'm not going to pull it out of the studio. I'm just going to leave it, and I'm going to take the Yeti on the road, and so I've rigged it up to the actually the tripod that comes with uh, that came with the Audio Technica, and then I've offset the balance on this thing to make the weight fall on the center so it doesn't fall over. And the goal is just to be able to set this, and you can't see it, but the goal is to be able to set it on the table and use it as an interviewing mic because the Yeti's got some multi-directional features on it where you can do a room sound or you can do an interview sound. Um, there's a variety of different, or just straight on audio. And so uh, the Yeti is going to go on the road. This is going to become my new road mic. As we go out, it's USB, which makes it even better for being on the road because I can plug that right into the laptop and uh, start Audacity and do the recording that way. So, so thanks, Blue. I just want to give them some props. Great mic. I'm still going to continue to use it, and um, and it will become the road mic going forward. So, some good kudos out to them. And if you haven't yet, most of us bought Yetis back. A good chunk of us bought Yetis back about a year and a half ago, and they were running through the podcaster ranks. And so I I just wanted to let you know I'm still using it. Okay, Kevin, 7.8 on Windows Phone. I know you. The, I, I used to bring you in. You're kind of our resident uh, Windows Phone expert along with Chris Lux. Uh, you said you were downloading the update today and maybe not. it didn't go so well. Yeah, and uh, while we were talking here, I, I did it again. Uh, the update, the phone looks like it's finished, but the update uh, seems to be stuck on 9. The phone says, uh, success, your phone has been updated. So you have you have a 900, oh, right? Ooh, it worked. Oh, show put show that to screen there. So show the it, new tiles. Uh, I haven't I haven't fixed it yet. Oh, okay. You'll, you'll notice the wash area is gone. Uh huh. So now I should be able to uh, modify. Uh, let's hit on somebody. Look at there. There's a I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little arrow next to the icon. And I can make it a little icon. Nice, and it'll be four wide when all is said and done, right? Yep. Yeah, just like the, the like the Windows 8, Windows Phone 8. Or I can make them massively wide. Yeah. So uh, nice. Now I can go through and start playing with my desktop. So hey, there. There you the, go. Uh, the the 900 has the 7.8 out. You you saw it here, and uh, that'll uh, I can get to work on that later as well. Yeah, I um, I, mine has not come. I've been checking when, on the Zoom, going to the update, and waiting for it to come. And it's I'm so I must be last in line. Maybe they're not going to uh, they're not going to roll it out for a while. <laughs> so I, I feel a little bit a little bit like Mike Howard. He's always the last to get everything on Google, and uh, and so I'm waiting for that that nine update. Christian, what's the update on your phone? You still have you have you made an update? My renewal comes June 24th, yeah. so I'm going to be, I think, I want to sprint, announce that they're going to be carrying uh, an HTC Windows 8 phone, so I think I might go with that. Okay. Um, uh, Kevin, there's a question in chat. They're asking, is this ni the 900 only, or is, it, is this coming to all, the, all Lumia, right, are getting updated? Yeah, uh, um, if I read the uh, press release properly, um, it's for all uh, Lumia devices, or it should be all, anything that was a Windows 7.5 phone, I believe, will make it to 7.8. Okay. Um, some of the early 7s, I'm not sure if they'll make it, but as far as I know, any of the Lumias uh, will get up to 
Okay. Yep. And I have a 900 too. Lumia new 900. And mine hasn't come yet. So if you're listening to this and you haven't gotten it yet, they're rolling them out in some kind of semblance of, of some order of some kind. Not everybody's getting it at the same time. So, all right, Christian, I was distracted. Tell me again what you're going to get or what you're uh, thinking you're going to get. I think I'm going to get a Windows 8 uh, phone with it. Sprint's going to carry a new one or two new HTC phones that are having Windows 8 right around the same time my renewal comes up. Okay. So Cool. Cool. All right. Christian's going Windows phone all the way. Andrew, you had put in the show notes, are you in a position to talk about the uh, how to build your, your own all-in-one PC? Oh, <laughs> and maybe in just a second. <laughs> He's going to try and get it. Well, maybe not. All right. Well, when he comes back, we will uh, we will be back here with Andrew in just a second. Kevin, let's um, let's unbox. You got a new you got a new gift from IOSafe, and uh, tell us a little bit about what you got. Uh, there, you, uh, you're seriously you're taking this out of the box, yeah, right, right now. I, I have my I have my my high tech Snap On blade. Uh, it wasn't a gift. I I, I bought in on the um, uh, Kickstart deal they had going. So and oddly enough, um, I just had called on this yesterday to see what the tracking information was, and the gentleman at I/O Safe said, "Well, I think it just was delivered to your front door." And my wife called and said, "Hey, that thing you were waiting for showed up." So <laughs> nice. So that was good. Nice. Um, now, why? Why'd you go? Talk a little bit about why you went with this. What are you? What were you trying to achieve? So the. Um, I think the cloud discussion is a great idea. Um, I just look at, uh, I've got a lot of um, family videos, uh, family pictures, and my idea with this guy is the whole idea of um, having something that's fireproof, you know, shockproof, waterproof. So I'm really going to use this for data that's not replaceable. And, and it was kind of a decision of should I just start putting all that stuff up in the cloud or should I go this route? Uh, and I, I had been thinking, hey, wouldn't it be great if IOSafe partnered up with somebody like Drobo? And within a week of that, um, um, Dave had uh, the folks from IOSafe on to talk about their partnership with Synology. I've always been a big fan of Synology and uh, decided to hop in and buy one. Sweet. And so that's... That's two great tastes that taste great together, right? So there's some Synology stuff on there. There's some IOSafe stuff on there. Is that running the Synology DSM 4.2, or is it a different version? Um, it, it'll be the latest Synology software. Um, I'd have to look up the, the code on it. Okay. I think it shipped. I think it will ship with um, current code. I know Dave and I had seen um, the latest or the, or the newest version coming out uh, at CES, so... That was uh, in the works as well. Yeah. So Mike, uh, um, yeah, Mike Martis is saying it's the Reese's peanut butter cup of storage. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it's it's uh, it's very heavy, and uh, hopefully you can see. Okay. So this is the there. one. Is that a screw on top, right? Because it isn't. Yep. There's a, a screw on the top and the bottom, and that face comes off. And they've got some things to allow air to go in. But as soon as a fire would start, those things would seal up and seal yep. your hard drives in there, right? Absolutely, and at CES they had uh, they had one that they had done their tests with uh, that was burned, and then soaked in a river for ten days. I think it was. Nice. So these guys these guys test stuff hands on. So you never know when your NAS is going to be at the bottom of a river. <laughs> well, they're they're. <laughs> it could they're, happen. Well, it yeah. could happen. The, they're, they're I like their logic. The uh, th their logic is a, a house fire gets up to yeah. could get up to about fifteen hundred and fifty degrees, so that's what they burn at. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the the time frame on setting in water is, um, you know, the, the other logic is so if this is in the upstairs of your house, your house burns, it falls all the way down, and so it has to be shockproof. And then when it's laying in the basement, it could take a few days to uh, get it fished out of the water. So hopefully your house never burns. But uh, um, so they they ship you the tool. Yeah, uh, that's a special proprietary uh, hex head, right? That 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 sets those screws in place. Yep. Uh, external power supply on it. Um, all the normal Synology stuff. And 
they used uh, they, they make a big point out of the fact that they used um, you know steel screws on everything and and uh, put a lot of effort in desi to designing the seal on the front of the unit so that it you didn't have to worry about torquing four corner screws um, it, it's just two screws on the face plate and two screws on the seal plate so can you show us the back of that thing sure when you get it up I like your uh, your, your version of, of where, where the box had come in handy, though, Kevin. You know, the house burns down, the river runs through, and when by the time you fish it out of the basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I that's mean, a that's I, a very viable scenario, right? Yeah, I don't know about I don't know about most of our listeners though, but if if, if my house burned down and that. Uh, then the then a river fl flooded through it. The last thing I'd be worried about was my data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. so it's pro you're probably right, Andrew. So one one gigabit Ethernet port, two yep. USB two back there. Uh, USB three. USB three. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And uh, power connection and a fan, and that's pretty much it. Did you get a chance to hear that thing at CES? Is it pretty quiet? It's actually pretty quiet. Yeah, the no noise levels are fairly low on it. They want you to burn the box. <laughs> well, Chad can, is with, saying we're in the box with 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 the ice, with the IO safe in it. Just proves that it's flame, it's flame resistant. Can, <laughs> uh, considering it was about ten below zero here in Minnesota this morning, it uh, I, I could have yeah. stood starting a fire. Yeah, it's it's super cold here too in in Omaha. The um, and so it they don't protect the board. Though right, I mean, if that thing burns, the the motherboard's going to burn in it, right? You're not going to. It's not going to save the equipment. Yep. It will save the drives. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it will save the drives. And it's a two. Is it a four drive? Two drive. Two drive. Yep. You're taking so this, the cover off of it right yep. now. Yeah. So this is the material. It's a it's a harder plastic material. You can see the the vent frames on the side. That's so air can get in and out. But uh, this is a foam material that when it gets heated up, it expands, and those air slots uh, close up. So it makes it watertight and heat resistant. You know, it's one of the things uh, you know. For um, one of the things I run into a lot is you know, friends of mine who you know say say are hunters. They have guns. They have a gun safe, and the gun safe's fireproof. And they put their USB drives in there. And then you have to have the discussion on just because a gun's not going to burn doesn't mean a hard drive. You know the yeah. the, the non-operating temperature of a hard drive is barely above its operating temperature. Yeah. The 800 degrees that's going to get inside that safe when the house burns down is going to Screw up the drives. Absolutely. Yeah. So th this black screw right in the center here is the one screw that holds that uh, uh, machined plate in place that uh, seals the drives in. Yeah. One screw to bond them all. That's it. One screw to hold them all. Same same exact head as the uh, the the face plate. Yep. So that's a user serviceable drive enclosure. Yeah. So you yep. can put your own drives in it. Yep. So and then there's uh, there's two um, just slide out carriers. These guys pop out. You put the two drives in. I picked up a couple of uh, Western Digital Reds to go in it. Uh, three terabytes, and my plan is to mirror those together. Nice. Now with the Synology software, then you're going to be able to kind of set up your own private cloud, right? That's got yep. some, that's got a lot of options. Synology has a lot of options to be able to let you do that. You can create an FTP server. You can create a. I think you put. WordPress on Synology. Yep, you can. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's what the drive tray looks like. Well, that's not bad. No. Very, you know, very well built, yeah. very nicely machined. All metal, so All that metal. there's no plastic melting in there. Um, it, yeah. the great attention to little things, too. Every screw in the box is designed so that it won't fall out. So on everything I've taken off, every screw is um, you know, machine fit in there, so it's that's not going to fall off. Yeah, that's dynamite. Very cool, Kevin. That's uh, how how long before you have that up and running? You think? Uh, tomorrow night, about. <laughs> You're staying up all night, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and it's got it's got some pretty. Looking at the um, the tech specs for it, there's some pretty cool stuff it does, like you know, security cam. Um, mm -hmm. By default, yeah, you can do, I think it looks like it says here you can do one or you can do up to eight IP cameras. Yeah, um, the Synology stuff that. is very well done. Yeah. 
and and that's a that's a great point. Is you 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 don't have to buy this fireproof waterproof guy to take advantage of the Synology products. You know that uh, the the standard Synology stuff is uh, quite affordable. Yeah. What what was the retail on that? Uh, this guy I think retails for five ninety nine now mm -hmm. without drives. Um, I I picked it up for four ninety nine on that uh, special deal they had going on. Okay, so hundred bucks. You know that's the really. that's the cost of the new Drobo uh, five. You know the five N is 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 five ninety nine. Mario at the meetup uh, leaked out that they're gonna they're they're gonna drop some hundred dollar coupon codes out for the five N too Ooh. at some point and bring those down to four ninety nine. I put a coupon code for the Drobo five N. For had forty dollars off that we saw on Amazon that lasted for a couple of days and has stopped. But yeah, so you know you get uh, two totally different purposes there, right? The five ends of five drive RAID enclosure. It's meant to set it and forget it kind of deal. Put the drives in. It manages everything. It's got that M SATA to speed up you know some disk caching SSD caching to speed up some of the drive transfers. This is really meant to be. Protect your data in if there's any kind of natural catastrophe there, and uh, and so two two totally different purposes. Mm -hmm. One one question I have of the Synology product, and I know um, we've sort of touched on this, and maybe it's something I need to ask Dave McCabe is how good is its bare metal re restore? So the um, you know like win Windows Home Server, you've got your you know you drop your disk back in and your USB stick and boot off it and you know, go and pick back up, you know, as of three days ago at midnight, you know, how, how good is Synology at, at bringing back a workstation? Kevin? You know, it's, uh, honestly, I've been away from Synology for a while, okay, uh, so, so. I, I, that'll, that'll have to be a, a, re, uh, a relearning from my point of view. I know they've made a lot of changes in those areas, so I'll be spending some time on that. You know, Andrew, nobody does it better than the home server. I mean, as as much as we've uh, the much maligned Windows home server, um, that bare metal restore is still the best uh, of that anybody's doing yeah. out there. A lot of companies are still struggling to get that done. Yeah, because one of the one, one of the awfully appealing things about Synology is you know it's pretty much a solid state box. You know, it does your directory services, your iTunes, your your backups. It does your VPN. It does you know your video streaming. You name it. it Pretty much does it all in one box, but if it can't restore your workstation, if your workstation dies, then you know, is it a, is it a? Well, yeah, oh, but it's a NAS, it, right? It's yeah, is it, it, and that's it. Do you treat it as a NAS and offload your storage mm -hmm. to it, or do you do you do you get a, a home server replacement out of it? And that that's where I'm torn at the moment because you know my home server is getting on three years old. It's got three disks in it that are permanently showing yellow in Crystal Disk Info, <laughs> and you know because of high high allocated sector counts. So do I buy myself an N54 and rip and you know throw Windows Time Server version one on it like like Zadler would, or do I um or do I um you know go for a solid state type box that's going to maybe get all the functionality that I've got out of Home Server? And something that's probably easier to support because one of the things I'm finding with with home server and small business server and whatnot is, you know, you spend so much time playing with this stuff at work and supporting it when you when you work in the industry that at home you just want something you plug it in, turn it on, not have to screw around with it to keep it going. Right. That's just me. I mean. Yeah. But and from a from a from a end user perspective, I mean the family don't care. You know, as long as they turn their PC on or turn the TV on, point the DLNA client at a source, and she can watch her TV shows or play music or whatever. And I think I, I don't know. I guess it's a question that a lot of people are going to ask in the, you know, in the in the coming little while. You know, Home Server 2011 is going away, as we know. Um, 2003 is end of life, official support in 2015. So. You know, where where do you where do you take it from there? Well, I think the average guy is still screwed when it comes to backup. I'll just be honest, right? So if we're talking <laughs> about the average guy, that nobody can get it right. They're lucky if they back up their stuff to another USB 
device, right? They're not spending it. They're not doing what Kevin just did and buying a, you know, they're not even close to buying a Synology. They don't even know how to spell Synology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So the average user, I think, is pretty screwed. I think the average tech guy who probably listens yeah. to this show is savvy enough to be able to make that decision and, mm. and go on the platform. Certainly on the Windows Home Server products, we're in a little bit of weird limbo at this point. It seems like there's a race for some of the manufacturers to fill in that spot, but many of them, while they're providing external storage, are not providing that bare metal backup solution. And for whatever reason, that is really hard to do. You know, I've heard these NAS companies talk about it. Oh, our engineers are working on it. We're coming up with our own software. Well, God, how long has a PC been around and still nobody does it really well? Acronis is one of those that does mm -hmm. it pretty well. Um, and, and so. And I, you know, and I, and I guess that's the question. If I'm going to put something in my mum and dad's house, where they, where I mean, they're they're on a 4G network connection, so they get five gig a month. You know, so it's not like I can connect them into a crash plan or a carbonite or something like that, right. and say, you know, you know what, send all your stuff to the cloud. So I've got to put something in there that's that's going to just work. So, so yeah, well, for me, that's almost that's almost version one home server. Windows 8 backup, right, works pretty well. And then yeah. you move those off to another drive, and then you you do some trickery, <laughs> you know you 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 do some kind of trickery, trickery to make sure that's backed up somewhere, right? And when because they're going to call you anyways, right? When they they're not going to ever restore this thing themselves. When it goes down, they're well, just going to call you. And yeah, and I mean at the moment what they do is they um they well mum plugs in a you know a USB hard drive into their desktop machine once a, every other day, but you know that drive sits next to the PC. Right. Mm -hmm. So if the house burns down, the PC is going to go and the drive is going to go in. Bless, Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> you got to yeah, say, very cute, Andrew. By the way, very cute. Very cute. Yeah. You know the you the, the uh, we're the a family, family we're a family friendly show here. I like it. We've got <laughs> we've got high we got seniors in high school. We have two month old, one month old babies. We've got it all. Well, these got. These guys would have been one today if they'd arrived when they were meant to be. Sorry, they would have been two. They were due on the 30th of, 30th of January. Yeah, f okay. it was, it was um, what day was it? What was her birthday? Go. It was 12-12-12. Twelve, 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 twelve. Yeah, yeah, okay. Last I, sequential yeah. date of the century. Kevin, you were going to say something? Oh, it just, uh, you know, and, and once again, it's it's still kind of complex for the average home user, but, um, you know, a friend of mine runs a small business, and what he opted for a few years ago was picking up, um, they do a lot of graphical media stuff, and he bought one of the Drobo Pro units, the 8-drive, um, mm -hmm. and basically threw an extra gigabit Ethernet card in each workstation, set up an iSCSI LUN on the Drobo, and then they just use a Cronus to make a, a full copy. So they just clone the workstation. Uh, the the because it's iSCSI, the the workstation sees that as another drive, and if they ever have to restore, they've got the boot disk from Acronis. They can just pull the image back over and and restore. So, so you know it's um, iSCSI is still kind of kind of a weird concept and scary yeah. once again for the home user, but that concept of being able to take a whole you know, clone image of your drive. If something died with your workstation, pop a new drive in and pull it back over. By the way, uh, Kevin, you'd asked me to ask Mario if there was iSCSI support, <laughs> and they said no, uh, they're, and they're not planning on it at this okay. point. They, they, so the, what they told me is they've got another protocol on there, and I, and I don't know I don't know what that is for network protocol. They they told it to me, and I was drinking, and I forgot. So so the box supports <laughs> SIFs, uh, and they probably said NFS as well. I think it was that. Yeah. Yeah. And and they said when you add sc iSCSI, they got really weird results. They tried it. Yeah, but they got really weird results, and and it slowed the box down even worse than yep. the old ones were, and so they just scrapped it. Yeah, um, so, uh, iSCSI takes you over to a block type of protocol, and it, it's a lot of horsepower and a lot of overhead. So I assumed it would be probably too much for it to handle. Good question. They were pretty impressed that I asked it. They're, there you go. I had two of their <laughs> engineers there. I think they were engineers. <laughs> They had two engineers and then three of their support guys, so it was good. We're gonna. I talked them in to let me do a live podcast from their support center here in Omaha at some point, uh -huh. and we'll get to interview. They've just opened up a new position for – this is Drobo now – just opened up a new position, a customer experience position. So they're working with customers that have had a great experience, and they're 
documenting those experiences and then posting them out on blogs for folks to say, hey, here's some different user, you know, different types, rather than just plugging it in and like the rest of us, you know, just using it on the network. These are customers that have used them in unique ways. And, uh, and so they're gonna, I'm going to go in and do a little podcast with those guys and, uh, and, and get nice. some behind-the-scenes stuff. No, yeah, very good. Um, at Drobo. Yeah, pretty cool. All right, Andrew, you had put this link for the build your all, your your own all in one. Yeah. Uh, in the notes. Yeah, look, I think you know, av, av, it's the average, a bit of an average guy project. You know, if you're after a um, an all in one, an all in one PC, but you don't like what's on the market, um, I found a thing went past me on ZDNet the other week, um. For using a uh, Intel Loop L5 barebone system, which is built around a 21 and a half inch 1080 monitor, um, and for around about a thousand bucks, you end up with a uh, all-in-one where you can pick the processor, the memory, the disk, um, build your own OS. Pretty pretty cool little project. Yeah, let me let me throw this screenshot up here of what this thing looks like. I think, let's see if I can find it right there. There we go. So it has, so the, you, potential to, so it has the potential to be, be your own Hackintosh as well in a way. Yeah. Yeah, well, interesting that it, in an all-in-one concept, I think we're moving more, you know, as the PC goes away, we may see people want larger screens, but we may see more and more of the PC just coming with the screen from here on out. Right. So, oh, yeah, you know, exactly. that, that might be the next direction. Yeah, it was one of the things we picked up at CES was uh, uh, monitors are getting thinner and the screens are getting nicer and every monitor vendor we stopped at was also showing um, their touchscreen monitor with just a normal mm -hmm. USB connection. So one of the things with the, the whole Windows 8 and touch, um, you know, I, I don't think we're that far from people um, you know, upgrading their home system to Windows 8 and upgrading to a touchscreen monitor and taking that route as well. Yeah. And, have, and have it everywhere, yeah. I mean, yep. you look at a lot of the, the notebooks that are coming out now, you know, you know, almost, almost everything you see hit the market at the moment has got a touch screen in it yep. for, for current release. So I think it's a matter of time. And, you know, monitors. You know, you look at what an IPS monitor a couple of years ago, at least out here, was, you know, close on a couple of grand. You know, you pick up a, a reasonable brand IPS now for, you know, under a under thousand bucks. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the uh, things. I mean, it's still a lot of money, but you know, I and here we go. Yeah, start. Yeah, HP staff pricing. I can pick myself up a 20-inch um, LED backlit IPS for under 200 bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've gotten really reasonable. Yeah, they have. You know, and to to round out that solution, um, I tend to use form. Fa um, HP and Dell have this ultra small form factor PC. Um, they're outrageously expensive if you buy them new, but if you if you get them uh, as they're coming off leases from companies, um, this is what I use for home theater PCs. Great form factor, but if you notice, it has a Visa bolt pattern on it, so they make adapters that you could bolt this pretty much right on the back of a monitor. So now, so what's so what's that got inside it, Kevin? Um, this one is uh, this one's actually. An older one that's a core duo. The ones I tend to use um, are 8200s that have i5s in them. Yep. It's a good yeah, idea. My, yeah, I've had a look at those in the past, and you know, you see them come up in the, as you say, in the merchants. Yep. The merchant sales and whatnot. So that'd be like an 8200 elite small yep. form factor. 8200 yeah. elite uh, USDT. And and my my disclaimer to everybody is if you're going to do home theater stuff with that one, um, that's the one you want. All the older versions of these uh, do not pass audio over the Display Port, so you got to get up to the 8200 from HP. Okay, I just had this weird I just had this weird moment happen. So I've been listening to BYOB recently, and they said Mike. Um, Mike Martis is out there, so he'll appreciate this. So I've been listening to BYOB, Build Your Own Box, right? And they kind of started as like, you know, talking about parts and hardware and numbers and serial numbers. And they've moved into talking about Windows 8 and all kinds of stuff. Tonight, we have gone, we've become BYOB. <laughs> we are talking, all we've talked about is hardware and different parts. So a weird switch has happened in the, in the internet <laughs> sphere. 
we have become BYOB. Anyways, uh, the, the, very the streams. Cool. The streams have crossed. We crossed the streams. Christian, you uh, did you made did you recently make an upgrade? I know you did to your monster desktop there, and I know you're having some issues. Did you get those all worked out at this? Yeah, point? I I cleaned it out. I finally got it to work with Hibernate, so I just left it at that and stopped messing around with sleep. Which I think is a byproduct of AM3 plus CPUs running on AM3 systems, but I could be wrong. I think there might be a bit of a BIOS thing that never got fully fleshed out. This is a beta BIOS, so. If um if cars are tablets and trucks are PCs, and you have a monster truck, are you always going to be a monster truck guy? Um, in, in what you build, or do you see yourself moving in, in the future, in going? You know, going thinner, going lighter, not trying to have as much horsepower on your PCs going forward. Is that a trend you see yourself in, or do you always see yourself trying to have the most most power available to you? Mm, probably, maybe with laptops, but definitely not with desktops. I love having the the all the horses out to the gate. So, okay, yeah. All right. Yeah, it's it's that's an interesting. I'm getting you know I'm I'm kind of that middle of the road guy. I've been a Core i three. A uh, uh, guy for a long time, the broadcast service studio PC, all Core i3 540s. I'm at this point, so first gen Core i3s, and they've been they've been great for me. A little trouble when I tried to do some stuff for CES, and so I borrowed a Core i7 to make that work. But um, mm -hmm. the, Core I, the Core i3s have been dynamite for me, so I I don't I just keep rocking those. But I don't know. There's some thought as things get into as Intel makes chips more efficient and lighter, at least on the studio end. I may need less to get more. And uh, and so they may get it may just naturally get lighter as we go forward. So I think there's a whole there's maybe a whole show around that as well. So we'll let that uh, we'll let that one go. Kevin, um, we're running a sh little short on time at this point, but I do want to ask you. You had some thoughts in there about uh, Office 2013 and and Office 365. I'll be honest with you, I really don't understand that much the difference between the two for the most part? I mean, I do, but I don't. So I know you were, you'd put some notes in there. What were your thoughts around that? Uh, you know, normally, I've just bought office packages, and you know, uh, here at home, it's my wife and I, and uh, we're, we probably never are the bleeding edge of it, but you know, still a couple hundred dollars if you buy legit copies. Uh, and you know, Office 365 is uh, I'm pleasantly surprised to see it's a hundred dollars per year for five PCs. So you know, money-wise, it's a pretty reasonable offer. Um, it gets you everything. It it gets you uh, Outlook and uh, Excel, Word, OneNote, uh, uh, Publisher, and PowerPoint. Uh, plus, you get the web-based versions of those. Um, so it, it's uh, uh, and actually, oddly enough, I think one of the Ziff Davis websites. If you go out and just Google. Um, Office 365 versus Office 2013. It, it they do a nice cost comparison of showing you know so 100 bucks a year gets you this. If you bought the packages, it gets you this, uh, and and that kind of led me into you know uh, uh, the the other post we had about um, you know that you can get Office 365 Exchange Server, you can get Office 365 Link Service, you can get Office 365 SharePoint. So. Um, a year ago, I probably wouldn't have considered renting software, and now it might be my next step. Uh, Mike is asking, which version of 365? Uh, different versions? I have not paid attention to... I hear it on Windows Weekly all the time, and I just have not paid it. I tell you what I'm addicted to is just the free web apps. I mean, yeah. for me, those work just perfectly, and, and I have not... Now, I have Office on my work computer, but I have, but I, I really, gosh, I don't. Um, I'm connected everywhere I go, and using the free web apps have, for ninety percent of what I do, have been fine. I just, you know. Yep. So, so when I first, and to me, it's still confusing. Uh, when I first looked at Office 365, it was you know strictly for business. If you type in Office 365 now, it takes you to a page that says for home or for business. So yeah, you can take two offering. different paths. So it, it's it's a new offering. Um, when you click on that one, it comes up as $99 per year, um, 20 gig of SkyDrive storage, 60 minutes of Skype worldwide calls, and five PCs how with... Oh, how much Skype? 60 minutes of Skype calls per uh, month. Okay. Oh, per month? Per month, yep. Okay. That's pretty That's, 
Yeah, that's pretty stupid, though. It's voiceover IP. They should just give it away for free, for God's sakes. Come on, oh, yeah, Microsoft. Yeah. But, but, but that's Skype out, though, not Skype to Skype, isn't it? I can make it tell. Yeah, that's Skype telephone out, right? You yep, you yeah. calling a landline, and that's free on Google Plus. I, I don't know why Microsoft's holding on to that call out. I think they think they're going to make money. I'll just go to Google Plus and make a phone call, for God's mm-hmm. sakes. Mm-hmm. You can make so, anyways, I interrupted you, Kevin. Oh no, no, that, that's good, good, good. Uh, you know, good discussion. I I think if you if you have more than three machines at home that you want Office packages on, and if you like to have the latest greatest Office packages all the time, um, you know it. I, I think the hundred dollars a year might be a good deal. Um, on your Facebook page, I, I posted a link to the 365 demos. Those are going on daily. Um, those are really good. They they answer a lot of questions. They give you a lot of features. They show some of the integration out with mobile devices as well. So I would encourage people to have a look at that if they're curious with more about 365. You bet. Kevin, thanks for all the posts you do out there, by the way. Facebook.com slash groups slash the average guy if you're not out there yet. Join us out there. A bunch of guys join this week. And I hope you're enjoying the, the conversation. Andrew, I also interrupted you. What was your question? It can't have been that important because I can't oh. remember what it was. <laughs> Very nice. A question from an office perspective. Uh, I, what do you, I mean, you're, again, we're all enterprise. You're in the education space. What are you using? How are you using it? How does it get licensed? How does that work for you? So... Now you're talking about from like a school standpoint or like from our network. Just what do you use for if you need to use Office? How are you getting it? Are you using it? Are you using something else? Technet. Okay, so you're taking advantage of your Technet subscription. Okay, so you'd have to buy it like any any other normal mortal, uh, so to speak, and use it that way. Have you been using 2013 or are you still in 2010? No, I'm still in 2010. The only reason I'd go to 2013 is because it can edit PDFs and all in all that's not like the biggest uh, deal, I guess. So, Yeah, both Nathaniel and Mike are saying, you know, there are some EDU discounts, which we should, if you have a .edu address, so if you're going to a university, do you have? You don't have an EDU. Your school doesn't have .edu, right? That your, your current high school doesn't? No, we have .org. Yeah. You have to be like a, basically a college or university to get yep. the EDU. If you're in a, if you're in the university system and you have an email that has .edu, I think you can pick it up for as cheap as fifteen bucks. So there's a lot of deals out there. They want to get those college kids kind of hooked on uh, on the Microsoft products, and so there's a lot. there's also you can get, you can get server. Uh, yeah, I see you put an eBay uh, link out there, Andrew. What's that too? Oh, I was just wondering if that's one of the um, slim form factor uh, PCs that Kevin was. Oh. Yeah, yeah, no, that's one of the ones. Yeah, Kevin, if you go to the chat, if you go to the Google Plus chat, let me show this real quick. I've just, I've just, I've just popped yep. it in the other chat as well. Okay, I, I've um, got it. Yeah, that that's a the, that's a seventy nine hundred. That's exactly the one I just held up. Um, mm-hmm. The only drawback on that guy is um, you don't get you don't get audio over DisplayPort, so you'd have to so pipe audio. On a separate HDMI card or something. In right. So as long as we're eBaying it. Um, do uh, Dell seven seven nine zero USFF seven nine zero USFF. Is this the one right here? It's an Optiplex. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, of and foolish me, all, all of your stuff will come up as Australia. The thing, the thing I so the thing I like about Dell and HP for this type of stuff is they have fantastic documentation, oh. and mm. Uh, Dell does so much OEM business that you will find a lot of people have these with no drive, no optical drive, um, no uh, no memory. So it's like a bare bones unit. And there is somebody selling these in the U.S. right now for um, uh, like a like 120 bucks with shipping. So if you have yeah. If you have a small pro, you know the thing you have to be careful of is you need um, 65 watt processors and down, so it's either i3s or i5s's, and uh, you know if you have an old laptop drive, two and a half inch drive, you know you can you can whip up a really nice uh, home theater or small form factor box for not a lot of money. Yeah, cool. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I was. Check that out. Yeah. 
when I when I put that in, I realized I was still in eBay Australia, so I was, <laughs> it, it doesn't switch over right away. And there's, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> Very sweet. Well, we have uh, we've gone long enough and come to the end of the podcast. We have a few more things to cover, but uh, I think we covered most of the good stuff, guys. A nice job of packing the podcast full of some really good info tonight. I do want to thank everybody that's out in chat as well. In fact, if you're listening to the recorded version of this, we do record the podcast live every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central, uh, over at theaverageguy.tv live. Um, the next two weeks, those will be the first two weeks in February of 2013. Um, I will know. I have to remember sometimes that these podcasts have legs that grow, and sometimes people listen to them a year after we've recorded them. So I'll just say I'll be out the first two weeks of February of, uh, of 2013. And so no live shows for the next two weeks. Going to take some time off. We'll give Christian some time to get some homework done and uh, and get ready for uh, what's coming up for him here in the in the uh, I guess in the fall next fall. Some exciting stuff coming from him and so we will patiently await some news for uh, from Christian and and where he's going to end up and and it will be great to do some podcasting from a dorm room somewhere in the United States right you yes can stay, you can stay here yes right, yes good enough so we're excited about everything that's coming but you can join us out there and of course if you are if you're watching the live uh, version of this and you are new to podcasting I, I've been pushing this every week but Stitcher is a great way to do it if you can just listen to the audio it is audio only but we have all the links available for Stitcher. Basically, it just really makes it an easy way to listen to the podcast on your on your mobile phone. And if you're not very uh, savvy with it, it's an easy way to get it done. Check out Stitcher.com. It's available for both iPhone and Android platforms. And do they have Stitcher for Windows Phone? Kevin, do you know? I think they do. You know, I'm, for Windows I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if I've downloaded it. If they don't, try the Podcasts app that's available on Windows Phone. We covered that over at the Home Server Show last week. We had uh, Rob Greenlee on, and we talked about that extensively. And uh, that's, a, that's an app that's free uh, in the Windows uh, environment, both for Windows Phone and Windows 8. You can check that out. Podcasts were available out there. That actually uses the Zoom backend uh, for all the podcasts, and we're there on Zoom. So you can pull in. Just search Home Tech. And you can find us. Of course, we're on YouTube, and you can subscribe to us out there as well. And uh, if you, if you, hey, let me ask you this: If you're interested in watching video, let me know. Because if you want a video on the RSS feed, Christian and I have to talk about that. Because that will, those video files get a little bit bigger. And uh, right now, I'm trying to push all that stuff out through YouTube. But if you just have to have the video through an RSS feed, I already had one listener let me know. If I get a couple more, I'll have to uh, up my bandwidth uh, at the. With my uh, internet service provider, no, not really, with my hosting provider, and we'll have to get that figured out on, on how that works and get it out to you. Otherwise, you can catch it on YouTube each week. Lots of stuff coming up. I appreciate all the communication that you have with me via Twitter and email and all those other things. If you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to the Ray Ortega um, interview that we did just an episode before that came out just a couple days before this one on the new home tech interview series that we're going to put out. Some very cool stuff. And then we did a very cool podcast last night over at Home Server Show. Chris Barnes, Mike Howard, Dave McCabe. Uh, I was just there goofing around. We talked about XSplit and uh, and the, the different ways you can get video out uh, on your podcast. And uh, we spent about an hour in a hangout and lots of great material. Head over to the YouTube page for uh, Home Server Show, youtube.com slash home server show. There's some great stuff out there as well. And... Um, Interested on that one? You can watch me driving home because I joined yeah, that's, as well. Yeah, that's that's right. Andrew is driving home and uh, joined us in the hangout. We had all audio, or we had yeah, all video and no audio from him. Yeah, um, we we could barely hear you, but um, it it, uh, yeah, it was kind of fun. It was kind of fun to bring in. So, guys, thanks for coming out tonight. We'll stay around for a little bit. If you're in the live stream, stay around for the post show, and uh, we'll hang out, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk about a few more things before we go. But uh, it's great having you all out. Christian and Andrew and Kevin, thanks for coming out tonight. Good night, everybody. We'll see you in three weeks. Good night. Good night. Have a good one.